I, my first memory ever, I'm five years old. <laughs> okay, here we go. My first memory ever, I'm five years old. It's winter, Princeton, New Jersey, 1975. I'm in my living room and I'm roughhousing with my cool Uncle Dougal. His real name was David, but everyone called him Dougal. He was a big guy, over six feet tall, barrel chested. He had a thick Virginia drawl and wore rose tinted John Lennon spectacles. So there we are, roughhousing, and what I did is I karate kicked him in the balls. <laughs> and what he did is he toppled over in pain. And what I did is I jumped up and down and victor victoriously and laughed because I thought he was joking. I thought we were still playing, but he wasn't joking. He was in agony. All of a sudden, my parents come running in from the kitchen and whisked him away to safety, and then I was all alone in the living room. Things can seem very big and empty when you're only five years old. And while I'm standing there, it dawned on me I had hurt him. He was in pain, and I had been laughing, but it wasn't funny. It wasn't funny at all. It was awkward. <laughs> awkward as in lacking dexterity or skill, ease or grace, lacking the right proportions, size or harmony of parts, social assurance causing embarrassment. My relationship with my cool Uncle Dougal never recovered from that moment. In fact, he sort of avoided me for the rest of my life and his. It's like I equate it to, have you ever met an adorable puppy and just think it's the cutest, most precious thing in the world until it pops a boner and starts to hump your leg? And then you want nothing to do with it ever again? That's what my childhood was like. A puppy with a boner. It's seventh grade, school has just let out, and I'm walking towards the bicycle racks outside. I see my friends are all marching off somewhere, and I yell after them, hey guys, wait up. They turn around, arms folded. You're not invited, says Nick. He's the pack leader. Why not, I ask. I look at my other friends for backup, but they stand silently behind Nick, staring at their shoes. We've decided we don't like you anymore, Nick says. All my friends cl close rank behind him, nodding. None of them will make eye contact with me. Nick decides to dig in a little bit. You're oversensitive, he says, then adding, and you're corny. <laughs> he smirks. They all laugh. I want to die. After that, they avoid me too. Is there any feeling worse than being avoided? It's enough to make you avoid being avoided. So what do you do? You hide. You hide from people so that they can't avoid you or blow you off or reject you. I mean, how can they avoid you if you're not there to be avoided? So you hide. You isolate. You look for ways to escape. A few years after the karate kick into the balls incident, my uncle moved out west to Oakland, California. I don't know the details that well, but from what I know, a friend of his asked him to watch a farm for a few weeks. My uncle obliged. The friend never came back, and my uncle was stuck with the farm. It was a sea urchin farm. He stayed there in Oakland with his sea urchins, but otherwise alone. Until he died. On purpose. I guess he wasn't just avoiding me. He was avoiding everybody. Now, I think I'm a pretty happy guy. I like my life, and more importantly, I like myself. I think I'm a pretty good person. Not necessarily a nice person. <laughs> For instance, people might describe me as standoffish, or aloof, or a dick. <laughs> All of which may be true. And when I say might describe, I really mean have described. <laughs> but despite my best efforts, I can't control what people think or say. 
The important thing is the important thing is that I think I'm a good person, a decent person. And honestly, I'd say it's not that I'm not nice, it's that I'm just uncomfortable around people. And that causes me to act in a certain way that maybe gives the appearance of not niceness, when in fact I'm probably just really unhappy. <laughs> not in general, just in that moment. Like, I'm not what you'd call the life of the party. In fact, more often than not, I'm not even at the party. <laughs> I'm at home with my wife and cats, puttering about the house, watching television, eating a snack, reading a book, or hand-painting small figurines of 17th century French peasants. And the reason that I'm not at the party is not because I don't like parties, it's more because I don't like people. And let's be honest, Parties aren't much fun without people there. It's like that thing. If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? Is, if there's a party but no one's there, is it a party? Can someone avoid you if you're somewhere else? But let's say I'm at a party. Let's say it's a cocktail party. Granted, I haven't been to a cocktail party since the mid-1960s. Which is impossible, but let's just say it anyway. Now, inevitably, there comes a time where I will find myself standing with other people, I'll call them acquaintances. In a semi-circle, I'm clutching a beverage, tightly, as though it were supplying me with blood and oxygen, as though if I were to drop it or put it down, I might collapse or disappear or melt like the Wicked Witch of the West, and I am talking with people whom I do not necessarily know all that well, with whom I may be only tangentially acquainted, and this is when my anxiety begins. Because invariably, each person in the semicircle has a well-formulated and well-articulated point of view on whatever subject is being bandied about. Let's call it the news of the day. And as the discussion lurches forward, I rummage through my psyche, searching desperately for something constructive and enlightening to contribute to the conversation I begin to feel progressively smaller and smaller because, like the character Morales in the Broadway musical A Chorus Line, I feel nothing. <laughs> and I think to myself, what is wrong with me? Why don't I have a well-formulated and well-articulated position about the news of the day? So while we all stand in our semicircle, clutching our beverages, discussing the news of the day, these people see a grown man in a, in a gray rag wool sweater, clutching his beverage, nodding like a common buffoon, <laughs> seemingly alert, seemingly plugged in, but he is not there. Because he is not paying attention any longer. He is lost in an existential crisis about the nature of his own identity. <laughs> He is crumbling inside, like a scone. <laughs> and then it's my turn to talk, and all I can think of to say on the subject of the news of the day is, well, you know, this is a real hot-button issue. <laughs> Look, it's not perfect. I'll be the first to admit it, but it will do. It should be enough, just enough to get by. However, when I do finally speak, what comes out of my mouth is not, well, you know this is a real hot button issue, but instead, well, you know this is a real hot bushin issue. <laughs> hot bushin issue. I fumbled the words. It is a decidedly awkward moment, particularly in that it lacks grace entirely. So I spend the rest of the night, the next morning, all of the next day, and well into the week, wishing desperately that I hadn't said bushin when I meant to say button. But I know it's not just me. Like I was in the pharmacy the other day, and the lady in front of me in line, who I might have, was dressed in clothing that might suggest the random passerby that she were a, what they call, hipster. Bangs, black rim glasses, a floppy hat, uncomfortable little canvas shoes, hermetically sealed jeans. So she walks up to the counter, shoulders slumped, hands deep in pockets, sunglasses on, as though she were incognito, as though she was afraid that someone might see her in the pharmacy, even worse, a CVS pharmacy, a chain. I mean, God forbid a cool person might need some over-the-counter medicine. 
so she walks up to the cashier. She says to the cashier, she says, yeah, um, do you have any Pepto-Bismo? <laughs> Pepto-Bismo. That is what she said. You see, she didn't want to admit that she knew what it was called. So she kind of acted like she wasn't sure. She acted like she had some knowledge of the name, but couldn't say for certain what it was. As if somehow only sort of knowing would compensate for what had been revealed in the asking. That she's just a normal person. I screwed up how she asked for it. Well, she went like this. This was too. Yeah, um, do you have any Pepto-Bismo? <laughs> that, that's what it was. That she's just a normal person. A mammal with bodily functions and instincts. And that's really hard to accept for some reason. There's just nothing fabulous or special about knowing that you're not that unlike a bear. <laughs> There's nothing romantic or aesthetic or dangerous about diarrhea. Yep. Do you have them, um, like, I don't, I don't actually know what it's called. I mean, I was a visual arts major at Pratt, so I wouldn't know anything about what people buy. I realize I'm in the belly of the beast. But my heart just fell into my ankle. But that's okay. It's called biting the hand that feeds you. I mean, I was a visual arts major at Pratt, so I wouldn't know anything about what people buy. I mean, if it's a Cy Twombly painting, then of course we can talk about it. The thing is, this thing is like Pepto-Bismo? I'm not even from here. I live in a houseboat. And it's not for me anyway. It's for my normal friend, Janet. My dad is Guatemalan and my mother's a triathlete. This is all. I don't, I don't even know why I'm here, because I would never be here normally. So like, I just want to be totally clear about the fact that, that, that I would never normally be in a pharmacy. It's just like so not familiar to me at all. You know, like, I'm way more into like avant-garde film and I'm such a homebody, you know? Like, Mostly just hang out with Ezra. <laughs> I don't even own a television. And I just want to say to her, are you really that afraid of what people think of you? Do you really care that much that you would even try to sway the opinion of this cashier who isn't even paying attention? Is it not a burden that it be so important to you that I see you the way you want to be seen, so much so that you pretend that you don't know what Pepto-Bismol is called, <laughs> that you purposely mispronounce it just for appearances, as if knowing the name of the brand of the medicine that you need <laughs> were some admission of mediocrity, as if anyone really believes that cool people don't get diarrhea. <laughs> you act like the concept of a medicine that would treat something as uncool as diarrhea is outside of your realm of knowledge. I mean, are you actually blah, 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 blah. Are you actually worried that someone behind you in the line is paying close attention to your every word. <laughs> and he's going to broadcast his findings to the world. <laughs> so I stand there traumatized, having fumbled my words. I'm back in the cocktail party. One of them says, Michael, what do you do? My most feared question on the planet. What do you do? And I know that my answer to the question will steer the conversation in a wildly different direction, a direction where I desperately do not want this conversation to go. Now, to be fair, it's an innocent question. That person is, in all likelihood, just making small talk. 
polite conversation about matters of little importance, especially between people who do not know each other well. For me, there's nothing polite about small talk. For me, small talk is war. And war is ugly. There's a winner, there's a loser. People get hurt. People die. Because when your answer to the question, what do you do, is I'm a comedian, things can get very ugly very fast. But I do it. I answer the question. I clutch my beverage tightly, and I say with confidence, chill, chin held up high, making direct eye contact, I'm a comedian. Now from this point, the conversation can go in a number of different directions, and none of them are good. First is what I call the Joe Pesci variation. They say, what do you do? I say, I'm a comedian. Then they say, oh, you're a comedian. Hey, everybody, gather around. He's a comedian. Hey, Mr. Comedian Man, make us laugh. Make us laugh, Mr. Funny Guy. Come on, you fucking clown. Tell us a joke, you piece of shit. And the worst part is, I can't remember any jokes. I mean, you'd think that since I'm a professional comedian, I could remember some jokes, but honestly, I'm terrible at it. I always get the punchline confused with the setup. Like, there's this guy, and he eats a bag of Cheetos, and then his penis is orange after he jerks off. It makes no sense! It's not a joke at all, it's just a description of what happened. And of course, no one laughs. Then they give me this disdainful look like, that wasn't funny. And this expression of disappointment comes on their faces, and before too long, they're looking around for an excuse to get away from me, and suddenly, I'm five years old, and I'm transported back to the living room as my parents and my uncle disappear into the kitchen, and I'm alone again. One time, I was at a dinner party, and people were going around the table saying what they did. There was a political blogger, a web designer, a teacher, a librarian. Then it was my turn. I tried to act like I wasn't paying attention to the conversation. This woman who said that she was a publisher, she was the ringleader, asked me what I did. I looked down at the pod tie in front of me, poked at it, and I thought to myself, why not? Go for it. So I went for it, and I said, I'm a comedian. I tell you, you could have heard a pin drop. The publisher woman made this face like she just sucked a lemon. It was sort of a, oh, a comedian. How nice for you, face. I felt like a secondary character in a Merchant Ivory movie. He's of a lower class and is invited to eat dinner with all of the aristocrats. The overly primped matron asks him what he does for a living and he says, I'm a cobbler. She smiles at him out of pity and says, dripping with insincerity, Oh, you're a cobbler. Did you hear that, Mr. Braddock? Our pathetic little friend Michael here is a cobbler. A quaint. Maybe you'd like to take a look at my boots after the meal, you fucking cobbler. I put on a game face and say, well, yes, Lady Ridgely, I'd be happy to. Then I make eye contact with Kate Winslet, and she looks down at her beef wellington and averts my gaze because she's, she's ashamed. <laughs> now what do you do? Now what do you do is a different question. You know, it's a difficult question, but how are you is even worse, way worse. Because what I hear when I'm asked the question is not how are you, but rather who are you as a person. I feel cornered like a wild animal because I know that what I'm supposed to say, what I've been conditioned to say is, I'm great. But what if it's not true? And even if it is true, it's only temporary. I don't want to lie or mislead in any way. I mean, do you really want to know how I'm doing? Do you have that much time? Because if you want to go there, I'll go there. <laughs> and then before they have time to break up the semicircle and get away from me, I'm off and running. I stole the laptop, okay? <laughs> I stole the laptop and I helped him look for it all day long. <laughs> you think that doesn't weigh on me? You think I don't carry that secret around with me like a dead weight? Then I storm out onto the street and sob uncontrollably. There's nothing fun about that. Who in their right mind would want to go to a party if they always wind up out on the street sobbing uncontrollably? Maybe Nick was right. Maybe I am oversensitive. Thank you very much.